Welcome to Dota 2 Laning, an introduction video covering hero roles and their expected locations on the map, in the laning phase and beyond. Quick disclaimer, this video covers just one of the many possible Dota 2 laning strategies. The map of Dota contains three lanes, often referred to as the safe lane, mid lane, and off lane. In the side lanes, left undisturbed, creeps will meet closer to one team's tier 1 tower than the other. That team has the safe lane in this lane. For the Radiant, it is the bottom lane and the Dire has its safe lane in the top. Opposite the safe lane is the off lane. Creeps here meet quite far from your tier 1 tower and the relative lack of safety often dubs this lane the hard lane. Only the mid lane stands symmetric. Roles and Position Hero roles, often referred to by their farm priority number, represent the responsibilities of each player. Unlike League of Legends, heroes in Dota are quite flexible. They can start in one position and may have to switch to another position if the game demands it. Flex picks are very common. The position 1 hard carry starts in the safe lane and has the highest farm priority on your team. They may begin the game fairly weak, but as they scale throughout the game, they are your team's best answer against magic immunity and enemy buildings. Heroes played in the hard carry role are generally defined by having a steroid spell that boosts their auto attack damage or capacity. Accompanying the position 1 hard carry in lane is the position 5 hard support. A hero playing this role provides good lane pressure and defenses for their carry. This may be the most versatile role in the entire game, and most heroes can play it. But those that are most popular include enchanters that have spells to buff their allies, healers, and heroes that have very strong crowd control or single target disable. Position 2, or mid, goes in the middle lane. Go figure. Mid heroes have good wave clear and early power spikes and are expected to do most of your team's front loaded damage. The position 3 off lane and the position 4 soft support often share the hard lane together. Both these heroes are lane bullies, often with most of their power coming in aggression early game. The tank should be the position 3 as they require some items to survive fights. Heroes played in the positions 3 and 4 also tend to have the strongest AoE initiation spells, such as AoE silences, massive stuns, crowd control of any sorts. Game Start Laning Phase In the side lanes, two cores and two supports face off. The hard carry is trying to last hit and bully when possible, and the off lane is trying to bully and last hit when possible. The supports, on the other hand, are locked in an all-consuming duel. The amount of tactics a support at this stage of the game has is overwhelming, and some even call it duties or responsibilities. These include cutting the wave, pulling the neutrals, warding, dewarding, stacking camps, and securing the runes for the mid lane. This is why the supports aren't usually in the middle of the lane are instead hovering behind some trees to one side. From there they can still apply lane pressure with spells and attacks from behind the trees, but are also much closer to the jungle from where most of these tactics are born. Choosing the correct tactic to use in a certain situation comes with experience, which is why the support role is the most difficult to get into while you're still learning Dota. There is a section at the end of this video focusing on some of these tactics and another on strategy around good warding. Laning for the core in the mid lane is a mix between what happens to the other two cores in this team. You are solely responsible to last hit and deny properly and zone your opponent as much as you can. This is the ideal creep position for the Radiant team. The Radiant range creep is dead and most of the creeps are on the ramp close to the Radiant tower. Minute 6 Power Rune Control The first Power Rune of the game spawns at the 6 minute mark, and alongside it, a Bouncy Rune spawns in the jungle. 
If the more dominant side lane can spare a support for a couple of minutes, that support should rush over to the mid lane before the rune spots. The strength of the power rune can enable your mid to start ganking and getting your team some kills. Sometimes, both supports from both teams will go and try and collect these power runes for the mid. And this is where you have the very first major clashes of your game. The mid at level 7. What happens next varies wildly game to game, but here's one common scenario. When a hero is level 7, one of their skills has the ability to be maxed out. It is around this time that the mid decides to leave the mid lane for most of the game and become a permanent roamer. This change in the mid lane cascades into the rest of the map and usually marks the end of the laning phase. The new vacancy in the mid lane is often snagged by one of the two supports, whichever one needs a little bit of gold and experience to get to their level 6 faster. With the hard carry now being left alone, and having some early items to play around with, they can hop into the jungle where they can farm much faster than what the lane can provide. Do remember that the lane creeps always give more gold and experience on average than the jungle creeps for the same amount of health that you need to kill. The difference being, there are more jungle creeps that spawn per minute than lane creeps. The mid may start by kanking the side lanes only temporarily, just enough to get some kills and some pressure off of your course. But after a while, the mid may go to the side lane to stay. Suddenly, your lane will have three pretty powerful early game heroes all grouped together, pressuring a tower. Later in the game, these three heroes may group again to become your team's gank squad. The safe lane tier 1 tower is often the hardest to defend early on, and when it falls, the safe lane becomes the dead lane. Why is that? Just note the spacing difference between the tier 1 and tier 2 tower in the off lane, mid, and the safe lane. Well before the 15 minute mark, the laning phase has truly fallen apart and this becomes the standard laning configuration for a little while. Support laning tactics. While still in the lane, focus on denying and harassing. When it comes to harassing, ranged supports have quite the advantage. Creep and tower aggro is 500 units, so with good positioning, you can continuously attack the enemy heroes and the enemy creeps will not bug you. If lane equilibrium is getting out of control, you may want to pull the jungle. Simply aggro the jungle camp close to your tier 1 tower as your creeps are coming past and have your creeps attack the jungle creeps. When done correctly, you can deny a lot of golden experience from ever reaching the enemy heroes waiting in the lane. To counter this, some support players may choose to use a sentry to block the enemy pull camp at the beginning of the game. In response, the enemy support might want to buy a sentry of their own to counter your sentry to counter their pull camp. Sentry battles can become quite fierce. Another tactic is to cut the lane and pull the wave. Aggro the enemy creep lane right before it goes to the enemy's tier 1 tower. Take them on an adventure and farm them somewhere safe. Warding Tactics These cliffs, also known as eye spots, are the most powerful locations to place observer wards and also the most easy to de-ward. See, everybody knows that you want to place your observer wards on the eye. So you have to be a little bit more creative when placing your observer wards so you're not feeding the enemy free money. The most common way to do this is to use the one stairs away tactic. Every single one of the main ward cliffs has multiple stairways near it. Most stairways are set up in a way such that if you place a sentry on the cliff, then you can place an observer down on the other side of the stairs 
and it will be out of range of such a sentry. This means that if an opponent is dewarding you by placing the sentry right on the cliff, they'll miss your observer. And what they'll have to do is they'll have to place a sentry somewhere between other common observer wet spots and the cliff. In the first scenario, oh, they missed your observer work, they'll have to use the second sentry to find your observer work. You net even by having the enemy sacrifice two sentries for your one observer. If you vary your observer locations, the enemy may choose to use the second scenario while they place a sentry in the middle. But if you've placed your observer up on the cliff, they'll need to use either another observer or an extra spell just to see your observer. If this happens and they use an observer, you know exactly where the enemy observer is that they just used to deward your observer, and you can go deward it for practically free. The general rule of thumb is, never place an observer ward in the same spot twice if it was dewarded the first time around. Here are a few more sneaky warding locations for your observer ward. If you've enjoyed this video, or you think you learned something, please feel free to leave a comment or a like. Subscribe to the channel if you want more random content like this. Uh, yeah, it's not consistent, so just do whatever you want. I hope to see you again soon. Later.